The right finishing move is an important ingredient when it comes to making a WWE wrestler into a WWE superstar. Can you imagine Steve Austin, for example, using the abdominal stretch instead of the Stone Cold Stunner? Or how about The Undertaker finishing off foes with the dreaded airplane spin? Wouldn't have quite the same effect, would it? In saying that, a badass finisher isn't exactly a guarantor of success in and of itself, and there have been plenty of lesser stars who, nevertheless, have ended matches with some of the gnarliest moves this side of the RKO. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 great finishers wasted on failed WWE wrestlers. Join us. Number 10, Sean O'Hare and the Widowmaker. Sean O'Hare seemingly had it all. He had the killer look, quite frankly ridiculous athletic ability, and at one point at least, an intriguing character that drew people in. A graduate of the WCW power plant, O'Hare was permitted to show off the full extent of his incredible high-flying ability during the company's dying days, regularly busting out springboards and his shockingly graceful swanton or shawnton bomb, which he used as a finisher. In WWE, he was in instructed to tone things down significantly and wrestle less like a cruiserweight, but he still had a cracking finisher. While stationed at developmental territory OVW, O'Hare used the F5, though obviously that was taken by a certain next big thing by the time he got called back up to the main roster in early 2003. So he unleashed the Widowmaker, fantastic name, which started in a fireman's carry position, but saw the devil's advocate drop his opponent backwards while he fell to his knees. Though primarily used against no-hopers on heat and velocity, the Widowmaker did land O'Hare some impressive victories over the likes of Eddie Guerrero and Rikishi on SmackDown. It's just a shame that that was as good as it got. Number 9, Luther Reigns and the Reign of Terror. Luther Reigns was, in many ways, as generic a WWE star as they come, especially for the ruthless aggression era that he was a part of. He was big and jacked and wore black trunks and boots and wrestled like a lumbering big man fresh out of OVW would be expected to. Partnering with Mark Jindrak and Kurt Angle for a brief period, WWE had high hopes for Luther and positioned him strongly, even booking him in singles feuds against Eddie Guerrero and The Undertaker. He never quite put it all together and his WWE main roster run lasted less than a year all told, but if nothing else, he did have a really effective finisher. Dubbed the Reign of Terror for added punishment, I presume, it started out with him holding his opponent in a reverse DDT position and trapping one arm before quickly spinning them out so they took a whiplash front bump. Like a hybrid DDT neckbreaker combination, the Reign of Terror looked very much like a knock out blow. If only Reigns had a full head of hair, a different first name with Samoan and used the spear instead, then he'd have really been onto something. Number 8, Ultimo Dragon and the Asai DDT. If I was a wrestler, well, if I was a wrestler again that is, I would probably name my finisher after myself so that everyone watching my matches knows how great I am. The Pachiti Bomb and the Pachiti Driver, they both sound like money. Legendary Japanese cruiserweight Ultimo Dragon certainly had the right idea, giving two of his famous inventions a little personal branding. Really personal, actually, because he forewent using either Ultimo or Dragon and instead used his real surname, Asai. In the early 90s, he innovated the Asai Moonsault, the springboard middle rope moonsault pressed to the outside, which was simply mind-blowing to witness at the time. When he eventually made it to WWE in 2003, he brought with him another new creation, the Asai DDT. Grabbing his opponent as if he was about to hit a cutter, the masked man would instead jump up and flip over his foe, landing on his knees while planting them with a sort of reverse DDT. Or a standing sliced bread number two, if you prefer. Sadly, the Asai DDT didn't propel Dragon to WWE glory, and his brief stay was spent mostly on sea show velocity. 
Number seven, Mark Merrow and the TKO. Mark Merrow sure was marvelous, wasn't he? I mean, it was his nickname and everything. He was also a wild man and had a wildly impressive moveset, truth be told. During his earlier WWE days, he perfected the shooting star press, which he dubbed Marvelocity many years before that particular move became as common as a headlock takeover. Likely in a bid to save his deteriorating knees, Sable's fella switched things up when he went heel cut his hair and started wearing boxing shorts. His new finisher of choice became the TKO, a sumptuous variation of the classic cutter. Hoisting his opponent up onto his shoulders, Mero spun them around and planted them face first onto the mat. It was a brutal piece of business and could have helped launch Mero up the card, but it simply wasn't to be since he was famously overshadowed by his sultry wife and ended up slipping down the card into obscurity. And then Brock Lesnar stole Sable and pretty much stole his finishing move too. There's a lesson here, but I'm not entirely sure what it is. I just hope Mark's doing okay. Number six, Simon Dean and the Curb Stomp. During his days as Blue World Order member and wannabe superhero Nova, Mike Bucci would routinely invent, or at least steal from Japan, wacky and wonderful moves that even the seemingly more educated ECW fans hadn't seen before. The so-called innovator of offense and most imitated man in professional wrestling completely changed his entire act in order to make it to main stage WWE, transforming from long-haired comic book reader to goofy fitness freak. The look, gimmick, and overall wrestling style may have been different, but Bucci retained his penchant for impressive finishers. At first, Dean used the Simonizer, which started off looking like he was going for the old angle slam, only to snap his opponent backwards before seamlessly floating over into a cover. Then, later in his run, Simon switched it up to the deadly curb stomp. And I mean, like, genuinely deadly, because if you put somebody on their stomach, pulled their arms behind their backs, and then stomped their face into the ground, it might actually kill them so please don't try it at home. Just leave it to the professionals, like the purple-clad pound shop Richard Simmons guy here. Number five, Tyler Rex and the Burning Hammer. Like the curb stomp, the burning hammer is a potentially very dangerous move that, if executed incorrectly, could have severe consequences indeed. It was invented by Japanese wrestling great Kenta Kabashi, who used it on rare occasions to end particularly long and brutal wars at a time when he was considered one of the very best wrestlers in the world. Tyler Rex was not one of the very best wrestlers in the world, nor did Tyler ever compete in a long and brutal war, but Rex did poach the burning hammer, because why the Hell not, nobody in WWE had really used it before. You could see why WWE had high hopes for Rex and the Burning Hammer was a good move to help the upstart stand out. Tyler switched things up too, delivering a more controlled version that landed opponents flatter, as opposed to on their head and neck, in more of a dropping DDT. Rex was allegedly forced to change the finisher after a request from a stern John Cena who witnessed a bungled up version that ended up looking too similar to his own FU. Number four, Marcus Corvon and the Pounce. Many WWE stars, past, present, and no doubt future, utilize the spear as their finishing move, and with good reason. It's as simple as moves come, but done right, few look as impactful. And since it's been used by the likes of Edge, Goldberg, and Roman Reigns on their way to superstardom, fans buy it as the real deal, too. In a fair and just world, Monty Brown's pounce would be right up there with the spear, and Brown, or Marcus Corvon to use his WWE CW moniker, would have pounced his way to a world title or 12. The ultra-charismatic former NFL player turned the wrestling ring into the gridiron by whipping his opponents into the ropes, hitting the adjacent ones, and absolutely battering the poor sods with a full-on football tackle that sometimes came close to knocking them clean out of the ring. The alpha male never truly got his due for various reasons, but his finisher lingered long in the memory, even if Monty has since retreated to the Serengeti. Besides, it's just fun to say, THE PER- Bounce, period. Number three, A-Train and the train wreck. WWE were positively determined to get Matt Bloom over, repackaging him with various gimmicks and giving him sustained pushes, despite the fact that he didn't exactly set the world on fire as a singles performer. In the early 2000s, Albert turned into A-Train and was positioned solidly in the upper mid card of the SmackDown roster. The trunks and grotesquely hairy back weren't the only things helping to distinguish him from his former guys, as A-Train also sacked off the Baldo 
bomb in favor of the train wreck. Now, I'm sure you're all expecting me to make some crap joke about how Bloom's WWE career itself was a bit of a train wreck, but I think we're all better than that, aren't we? Actually, no, we're not. But the train wreck was a significant improvement on the Baldo bomb. Putting his opponent over his shoulders as if to powerbomb them, he then jumped in the air and dropped to his knees, landing them in a vicious backbreaker. It was very simple, yet highly effective, but unfortunately, it couldn't stop the A-Train from driving right off the tracks. There it is. Number 2. Darren Young and the Gut Check Darren Young had many of the tools required to make it big, though he perhaps didn't get the requisite opportunities to become a star in his own right while working for WWE. The primetime player has since proven, as Fred Rosser in New Japan and the NWA, that he had a lot more to offer away from tag teams, and perhaps the former WWE Tag Team Champion could return to the fold in time. If he does, he better bring his gut check finisher back with him, since that was one of the best things about his act during his spell with the company. Gutbusters always look like they legitimately hurt, and Young's was one of the best in the game. An incredibly strong man, Mr. No Days Off had no issues but busting the guts of even the biggest WWE stars by putting them on his shoulders, throwing them forward through the air, and down onto his knees. It's not the fanciest move out there, but the best finishers rarely are, and the gut check really deserved to result in more Ws and millions of dollars, millions of dollars, millions of you. You know how it goes. Number 1. The Spirit Squad and High Spirits There wasn't too much to celebrate when it came to the Spirit Squad, the ultra-annoying group of male cheerleaders that were all over WWE Raw in 2006. Though they won the World Tag Team titles and were placed in major storylines and even headlined a friggin' pay-per-view, their greatest contribution to the product was getting routinely pummeled and humiliated by D-Generation X. If nothing else, they at least took advantage of their strength in numbers and came up with a brilliant five-man finisher. The High Spirits saw each member of the group grab a limb before, on the count of three, launching their opponent about eight or nine feet into the air, sending them crashing down for what was essentially the equivalent of a bump from the top of a ladder. It always looked breathtaking, and I can only assume it literally took the breath away from its victims, especially when someone happy to fly like Shawn Michaels or Rob Van Dam was on the receiving end of it. The Spirit Squad may have been little more than a joke, but there was nothing comical about about the high spirits. Apart from the time they did it to Big Show, that was pretty funny.